13 Week Theater is supported by Patreon. Subscribers get exclusive early access and by the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. Seventy-seven and 78, what could be considered the television equivalent of a perfect storm would alter the face of the medium forever, launching a number of long careers and nearly bringing others to an abrupt end. First, the Mary Tyler Moore Show ended in the spring of 1977. While its last season had seen it fall out of the top 20 primetime shows, when it signed off, it was still one of the most popular and beloved shows of all time. And then, in March of 1978, Carol Burnett decided to end her long-running variety show, even though CBS had already decided to renew it for a 12th season, leaving them with a gaping hole in their Sunday night schedule. Now, I do think it's classier to leave before you're asked to. And the fact that CBS picked our show up for a 12th year and was quite adamant about it, is very flattering to all of us here on the show. However, I am adamant too, and I, I am so proud of our show, and quite simply, I'm no dummy. Now is the time to put it to bed. While the network was still pulling in the numbers with follow-up spin-off Lou Grant, they still were eager to capitalize on America's TV sweetheart, Mary Tyler Moore, as much as possible. And Mary herself was feeling bored and looking for a new project. So, while the identity of the culprit appears to be lost to history, someone, somewhere, had what had to seem to them the perfect answer. Replace Carol Burnett with Mary Tyler Moore. Tyler Moore's husband and chief executive of her production company, Grant Tinker, tried to talk Mary out of it. Like Burnett, he felt that the classic variety show format was on its way out, and he predicted that the end result would be a disaster. But CBS and Mary were insistent, so the die was cast. Hoping to carry on a little of the Carol Burnett Show's magic, Tyler Moore and Tinker tapped Burnett Show writer Tom Patchett, who had also written for MTM's Bob Newhart Show, to create the new show. He pulled in his writing partner Jay Tarsies to help him bring the show to life. And for good measure, CBS set them up in the same studio that the Carol Burnett show had used, sets and all. Hoping to not only appeal to classic variety fans, Tarsis and Patchett decided to make the show appealing to a younger audience with a bridging the generation gap concept for the show's repertory company. Veteran comedian Dick Sean, known as the face and voice of numerous creations and the only person who could do a better imitation of Larry Storch than Larry Storch would head the company, along with comic actor James Hampton. For the younger side, they tapped Fernwood Tonight writer Judith Kahan to both write and perform on the show. She recommended Michael Keaton, who had worked with her on another sitcom, uh, but that's another story, and comic actress Swoozie Kurtz, who had broken out with her performance in the film Slapshot, rounded out the repertory company. And as the show's announcer, they hired some weathermen from Indiana. Hi, Mary. My name's Dave Letterman. Why should you hire me? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. I know how to make your show the number one smash hit of the decade. How are we going to do that? Not with outer space buffoonery. Sex and violence? Who needs it? Well, who needs violence, anyway? <laughs> now, Mary, you and I both know what's going to get you big, big ratings. Harp music. It's Mary Tyler Moore with a whole season of comedy and a brand new show. Get ready to turn on to Mary. This fall on CBS. Mary debuted at 8 p.m. on Sunday night, September 24th, 1978. The result was as Tinker had predicted, a disaster. Um, 
Loudon Wainwright III is a songwriter a lot of you may not know by name, but he's written some charming and catchy songs, and I'd like to do one of them for you tonight. Dead skunk in the middle of the road. Dead skunk in the middle of the road. Dead skunk in the middle of the road. Stinking to high. Before we go into this next number, I'd like to say something. One of my dearest friends is Ed Asner. Boy, I can still remember the time Ed auditioned for the old show. He came in with his hat in his hand, this little threadbare hat. And he said he really needed the job, that he would owe me his life. Well, with that in mind, I called Ed and I asked him if he would like to be a guest on our show. And he said, Mary, I can buy and sell you. <laughs> One of the major problems with the show was its bi-generational approach. The team of 13 writers was split pretty evenly between old and new writers, much like the repertory company was a mix of young talents and veterans. The two groups had very different styles and approaches, and they clashed, resulting in a very schizophrenic product. Hi, how you doing? My name is Michael Keaton, and uh, quite frankly, I, you know, like, I don't understand it. I mean I, I mean, I know why my name is Michael Keaton, but I, I don't understand why I keep getting letters from all these guys asking for dating tips, you know, but hey, I get them, you know, so uh, I got a couple of, here, of them here, and uh, let's read them, you know, I'm more than willing to give some tips. Here's one from, uh, here's one from Skip in uh, Hilton Head, South Carolina. Skip writes, uh, hey Mike, you're too much, man. I really dig your lifestyle. <laughs> okay. Okay, Skip says, uh, how do you impress a chick the first time you take her out? Okay, Skipper, uh, it's your first date, right? And uh, you really want to impress her? Hey, do what I do. Wear a shirt. <laughs> no, I'm serious, you know, at least on the first date, and then you can get back to normal a little bit later on. It's, it's 10 o'clock, and now with all the late breaking news stories, here is the Carmen Merengue news team, including Carmen Merengue with sports. A look at tomorrow's weather with meteorologist Dr. Carmen Merengue. And now, here's anchorman Carmen Merengue. Good evening and Tico Tico. Here's what's happening at 10. <laughs> Dignitaries from every nation gathered at the dedication of the new Carmen Merengue building in downtown Barcelona. <laughs> sure is a fine looking Where building. Where are the clouds? Send in the clouds. Kurtz, Kahan, and Keaton seemed out of place with material planned for the traditional variety audience, and Sean and Hampton looked like they just didn't understand the younger, hip humor. It also didn't help that at this early stage in their careers, the producers didn't yet see the comic geniuses that Keaton and Letterman would later prove to be. They were underutilized as performers and were not allowed to contribute any written material of their own to the show. And finally, as Tinker and Burnett had predicted, variety shows, as they had been known since the days of Uncle Milty, were dying out. Tony Orlando and Dawn ended two seasons before. Sonny and Cher had packed in in a year before. And stalwart Donnie and Marie wouldn't make it out of the 1978 to 79 season either. The format was just becoming old hat and just could not hold on to viewers. It also didn't help that the younger viewers that Patchett and Tarsies hoped to attract had something else to watch Sunday nights at 8. The ratings started bad and fell through the floor in the second week. The writing, as they say, was on the wall. CBS pulled the plug before the third episode could air, but with such short notice that they didn't have anything to plug into its spot, they let it air anyhow.
watching. And remember, a day without a smile is like pajamas without feet. <laughs> While the ratings and critical disaster, Mary would have a long-lasting legacy. It brought Michael Keaton and Swoozy Kurtz to prominence, lighting a fire under their careers. Tarsies and Padgett would go on to write The Great Muppet Caper and The Muppets Take Manhattan for Jim Henson and started a long-lasting relationship with NBC. Together, they would create the low-rated but critically acclaimed sitcom Buffalo Bill for the network. On his own, Tarsies would create TV's first successful dramedy in the form of The Days and Nights of Molly Dodd, and Padgett would create both the character and sitcom ALF. But probably the biggest impact Mary had on the future of television came about indirectly. During the show's short run, David Letterman was introduced to one of the staff writers, a woman named Meryl Marco. They fell in love with each other, forming a professional and personal relationship that would culminate in 1981 with a little show called Late Night with David Letterman, which changed the face of late night TV forever. And as for Mary Tyler Moore and CBS, well, they took it on the chin and decided between them that the 78-79 TV season just wasn't the right time for damn it. From Television City in Hollywood, it's the Mary Tyler Moore Hour, starring Lucille Ball and Mike Douglas. But that's another story.